Okay. Uh, the comment today will be uh, delivered by Susan Connor, Professor of History Emerita and retired Provost of Albion College in Michigan. She earned her PhD from the Institute on Napoleon and the French Revolution and has worked in French history and women's and gender studies throughout her career. Her book, The Age of Napoleon, was published in 2004. Um, she's done a lot of work on marginal and dispossessed women, poverty and crime, issues of the body and politics, women soldiers and prostitution. Has published many articles um, and is um, completing a book, uh, Four Centuries of Prostitution in Paris, uh, a, a book of essays that will be coming out soon. So. Um, Thank you, Susan. This panel reexamines the memory of the so-called dark years of resistance of Vichy and the German occupation. It opens again the self-imposed amnesia of the immediate post-war period, the Gaullist myth, and the debated role of women in the resistance. These are interesting papers in their own right, but collectively they raise significant questions about resistance and memory and provide a rich tapestry in which to explore them. In the years since the 1970s, much exploration of the resistance has taken place, including several early inquiries into the role of women. In fact, one of the first papers was in 1977 at the Western Society. Not only was the resistance no homogeneous four-year period, women's roles vary dramatically. As Paula Schwartz wrote in 1987, quote, women were present throughout the resistance movement from positions of leadership to the base. Women ran missions, collected intelligence, printed and distributed clandestine, clandestine newspapers, smuggled arms and ammunition, staged demonstrations, and committed sabotage alongside men, close quote. Some women were apolitical, some were engaged in what they conceived were their traditional roles. Some felt they had a higher ethical calling. Some were communist, some were socialist, some were tied to the free French, and some were simply trying to make ends meet when their husbands had been deported and they were de facto single heads of households. Women were often not in networks, or they went undercover and worked clandestinely and in isolation with little or no contact with families or friends, or they worked in social services using their positions to transmit messages, gain access to printing presses, or hide, feed, and transfer potential um, detainees through subterfuge. The risk was incredibly high, equally high as their male counterparts. As Delano, oh, say your last name. Delano. Delano, thank you. As Delano has pointed out, led by de Gaullist, there was always a male-oriented perspective, although I might reframe it as a militant and military perspective that characterized the resistance. De Gaulle, after all, was outside of France, occupied with the contest of the Free French rather than the daily subversive operations of not all the French, but of many French, including significant numbers of women. As soon as France was occupied, there was also a rhetoric of the sins and evils of the Third Republic that had brought about the defeat of France. Quote, the defeat was punishment for the sins of the Third Republic, wrote Sarah Fishman. Quote, as paid vacations, Pernod, strikes, bad films, bathing suits, democracy, lack of religion, low birth rate, and the decline of the French family, close quote. The Vichy re regime, we know, willingly adopted the German mantra of work, family, fatherland. So now to the papers. In the first, we have met two American women, one the partner of Marcel Duchamp and the other a career member of the consulate. In the second, we meet and then lose Hélène Baer, a 21-year-old French Jew whose fiancé joined the Free French, but who stayed in Paris in spite of the potential and ultimately real consequences. In the third, we meet Lucy Aubrac, the heroine of the resistance and then a victim of Klaus Barbie's lawyer's tactics. What do they have in common and not in common? In each, we are dealing with memory. In Bear's case, it is a diary destined for her fiancé and written during the events just prior to her deportation and death. In it, she sought to memorialize the horror that she saw saw as part of her work with the Ujif. 
Quote, for how will humanity ever be healed unless all its rottenness is exposed, close quote, she wrote in 1943. Ultimately, the diary is published, as she said, in 2008. In the case of Mary Reynolds and Constance Ray Harvey, there's correspondence, other records, and so on. But as Delano, as Delano <laughs> suggests, quote, can we simply accept claims if the deeds themselves are not part of the historical record? And finally, Lucy Obrecht's 1985 Journal Intime, which was published in English in 1993 as Outwitting the Gestapo. It describes a nine-month ordeal when she was pregnant to free herself from the Germans in Lyon. There are actually three directions that I would like to go with our panelists. First, should we try to divine resistance? Most historians of women in the resistance have argued for a broader definition, but they have tended to shy away from offering one themselves. In one way or another, each panelist has said that the woman or women whom she was studying remained in France because she saw herself as indelibly French, even the, the Americans. Was there then a tie between Frenchness and resistance? More than that, is it possible to venture a definition of resistance as it applied to women? Second, as we know, French women adopted positions that were typically tied to traditional roles in French society. The Third Republic had already institutionalized various legislation supporting the family, restricting women's employment, and promoting pro-populationist causes. Vichy and the Germans reinforced and strongly augmented those policies. I'm interested in comparing the roles of French women and American women. American women apparently did not have the baggage that defined French women in the private sphere. Throughout the occupation, French women stepped out of that role every time they engaged in resistance activities. And they knew they were in between the public and the private sphere, although they couldn't find a language for what they were doing. In fact, after the war, most French women did not talk about their experiences with their children or with others. They were silent, circumspect, and invisible. They'd stepped back into, tra into traditional family roles. American women, on the other hand, often socialites with money and French ties, did not function in that way. What comparisons can be made? What does this say also about French society after the war? And finally, and most important, what is the role of memory? We know as historians that the actors on our stage dealt in personal memory and or what could become later collective memory immediately as Baer did or later as Obrecht. On another hand, we deal in historical memory as we use our stories, recollections, letters, and other correspondence to ferret out what happened. We also know that the very act of writing assumes an audience by the choice of words, the choice of events, a message. Hooper Hammersley argues compellingly, quote, things are more than just true or false. The full breadth of history is revealed in the gray areas, areas of human telling, close quote. In the re-examination of the resistance so many years after it took place, and often amidst controversy, for example, the Klaus Barbie trial, how do we measure memoirs? How do they fit into our history with a capital H? Because I have dealt with memoirs as historical artifacts in my own research, I was particularly moved by Margaret Weitz's remark that, quote, these details give texture and life to history in the broader sense. To focus only on the grand gestures, to neglect the quotidian is to distort the historical record, close quote. Ultimately, then, how do we deal with memory and those who have constructed it? And I'd like to turn this over then to Sarah and to the panel. Thank you. Um, and because we are so uh, short of time, I would like, to, uh, even though I'm sure the panelists would like to respond, I think I would like to just open it up to audience sure. questions. Um, there is a microphone if you have a question. Um, Please let us know.
in that case, if you guys would like to uh, respond. <coughs> oh. <laughs> Unless somebody has a what, 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 stuff. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. No, no, go, go. Um, I have a, a question for Paige. Yes. Um, I'm very interested because I'm actually working on some, an American who goes to um, work with the, uh, the FLN, but she also has ties to Marcel Duchamp and Max Ernst and various other artists. So I wondered whether you'd sort of followed it up after her involvement in the war and found out what had happened um, to Max Ernst and uh, Duchamp in relation to her. Well, uh, who was the woman you... Gloria de Herrera. Okay. Um, I've seen her name, but I, it's fascinating. Um, Duchamp stayed in the United States. He and Reynolds had kind of s separated. Um, he was very reluctant to come back to France. He thought there was going to be a communist revolution, um, and that scared him. Uh, Reynolds um, died in 1950. She, she was very sick, and Duchamp actually came back to care f to help care for her and cleaned up her house and I assume some of their letters and correspondence were uh, he uh, deep six them I think um, Max Ernst um, left um, after being interned in the south of France right um, snuck out to, with the help of Varian Fry uh, and his group and um, he actually offered to marry again. I'm not sure how many wives he had, but he had a Jewish wife. Um, in Mary Juliet. Was it, uh, that's yeah. who it is. And she, he offered to marry her. She wouldn't do it, and she was later deported. She, she went into but, hiding. No, if it's the same ended, person. He ended his life with Juliet. No, so it's, a, it's no, the earliest wife. Right. I, um, because they left in 1951, right. Duchamp, Ernst, and, and de Herrera. This right. is why I, I, I find that sort of in, in between period very interesting. Right. But it's interesting how Mary Reynolds has really disappeared from most biographers. I don't, Duchamp kind of kept it a secret, I think. I, he, um, and he was, I think he stopped womanizing for most of the time that he was with <laughs> Reynolds, I'm not sure. Um, but he pretty much lived with her on Allée. Um, and they signed letters together. They were, their letters to Man Ray, their letters to Brancusi, where it's we, we, we. I mean, W-E, um, we, um, and, um, but, and Ernst, um, I, I know that there were, there were, there was interest in Jimmy Ernst sh having shows with, Ren with um, Duchamp, so there was ties. Reynolds was working with a journal called View right, right. Um, until her death, okay. um, so there were ties, yeah. Thank you. These are like amazing papers, all of them, and um, relate a lot to what I'm, I, I'm trying to write about as well. But I want to ask a question about whether there's any kind of gender difference in the memories that you're talking, that the panels, that all of you are talking about. Did women focus on particular ways of reflecting? It is on. <laughs> I have a very soft voice, so it's pretty. Yeah. So if, can, you, can you reflect a bit on that, if there's a gender difference in the types of memories that are put forward? I think that, um, it, generally speaking, and then the, in the work that I've done on women in the resistance, many of them didn't speak about it afterward. And so they had this particular role during the period of the resistance, and then they go back to their lives. And some of them are compelled to write about it. And how they write about it, sometimes it's w within a gendered context, if you will. I, I hate to get tied into those kinds of constructs anyhow. And uh, Susan asked the question, you know, writing assumes an audience. And so uh, some of the writing seems perhaps whether it's constricted because should I as a woman say what I have to say? Does that have any bearing on what I have to say? Um, I think in the case of, of the three or four women that I've looked at, they're telling their story whether it's at the time or reclamated later. And, and the, the conflicts for them are, are simply wrestling with, you know, old, old dem devils and, and um, painful memories that we can't even grasp. I, I would, in, in that context, note that Opat frames the story within her pregnancy. 
that story what? she frames it in her pregnancy, but as I but as I sort of went through the trajectory of her works, mm -hmm. that's one work. Right. And she has set exigeant liberté with uh, Corinne Bouchou uh, and the other word naissance et organisation, and then many many interviews, right. lots of times in schools. And what and the, the the deal is she's pregnant. Right. She's got a small child, so she's protecting, and she absolutely frames that. But that's one piece. Right. Well, and it's also relevant because it's what she uses to get her husband's release. Well, it is because she goes to Bobby and she says, "I'm with this guy Ermelin, and and I need to be married so that my child's not a bastard. It's a whole, you know, it's all a lie. They're already married, um, but she's driving a truck. I mean, she there she crosses all kinds of, as we would say, gendered lines. Just somehow this uh, idea of uh, memory makes me think of um, uh, having done some work on the Holocaust and teaching a class on it, and that uh, there seems to have been a, uh, let's call it a silence about discussing anything that happened between 1945, the end of the war, and at least 1960 uh, with the Eichmann trial and, of, uh, and the publication of Jean-Francois Steiner's uh, Treblinka. And, I, you know, and also I'm just thinking in terms of memory uh, uh, with people who uh, survived, who uh, were soldiers in uh, World War II, at least from the American side, and having known a number of these veterans who some of them never wanted to talk about it until late in life. And it was a actually sort of like, um, how I went through this and finally, I, I think someone should know what I had gone through, and so it was a time to uh, a kind of a reckoning. And I'm wondering, could you say the same thing about these women? And maybe was there a little bit of a change because because the um, the way society perceived women, and especially in the 1960s, where you have dramatic changes, which even began to affect the French a little bit later, but still began to affect them. Is there some sort of relationship there? Yeah, um, well, I can. I guess I can respond to that using Hélène Baer's diary, and I think the relationship between Hélène Baer, her diary, Jean Moawiski, and Mariette Job is very interesting because John gets the diary in when he comes back in 1945 and doesn't and holds on to it in private possession for 50 years, and it's only when Mariette Job, who's not of the same generation, she's the next generation in the 90s, I guess in the, this period of l'obsession de mémoire, um, she decides that she's going to contact Jean, get the actual original manuscript, and then I guess works for about a decade with the Memorial de la Shoah to publish it. I think it is interesting that it took Mariette Job and not Jean to publish it. Um, Jean was, all, was involved in the resistance in the Free French. I don't believe he ever wrote, he, he passed away in I think 2007, I don't believe he ever wrote um, a testimony or a something about his experience, either based on memory or during the time, um, and that it was um, Ellen's niece, a woman, who decided that she was going to publish uh, the diary. Um, I think in terms of the memory of Ellen, I don't know if gender, to go back to your question, I don't know if we think of Ellen's memory as gendered in any sense, but certainly her her work in the resistance is gendered. I mean, I don't, she never even considers taking up arms or going to fight, just like Jean and her first boyfriend at the very beginning of the diary, Gérard, he also left to join the Free French. There's definitely um, like a dichotomy between what she could do and what they could do. And then, of course, she um, cared for children um, during the war and took on that sort of motherly responsibility. I uh, Just one thing. for, for um, There were 500 American women interned in Vitel and 2,000 British women. Those women, in general, were silent. They went back, as most women did, to their lives. Uh, the nuns, uh, maybe some, they were newspaper accounts of their experience, like Nebraska, and some nuns who had been released on the grips home. Um, some people, Edda Scheiber, when she was released, she was released in an exchange. She wrote a book that was really uh, a war propaganda. Uh, and then there's just the recent story of Mary Berg. I don't know if you've seen there was an article in the New York Times a few days ago. She was a Polish Jew slash American. Her mother had American citizenship and she, along with a handful of Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto, came to Vitel, 500 or so, um, with some kind of American or South American citizenship. The, the Germans sent most of them back 
to Drancy and to their death right away, including the, the, um, the poet Yitzhak um, Katz Nelson. Uh, Berg wrote a diary when she got to the U.S. It was very popular. She came in 44, 45, I don't remember. And then she, and, and she did press releases, lots of things, and then she disappeared. So I think this is a story of a post-diary silence. Um, and and the, there were some things of hers up for auction just recently, and the family um, stopped it because they thought these were too personal and would kind of fetishize her life. But she really disappeared, and if you want to find out what she did after her diary and how she lived her life, she, then she silenced herself. So that's an interesting kind of flip on this. Well, yeah. I'd like to thank all of the uh, panelists for excellent uh, papers. I'm afraid that we're already over our time limit, so I'm going to um, ask everybody to come up with questions. If you thank you. Thank you.